going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening and welcome to Delving Deeper. I'm your host, Sonolala. Joining us this evening is the Honorable Foster Cummings, the Minister of Youth Development and National Service. Good evening, Minister, and welcome back. Good evening, Sunil. It's happy. I'm very happy to be here again at Delving Deeper. Very Thanks nice to have you here. So the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, it was formed in 2020 uh, with initiative geared towards improving the lives of young persons. From then to now, um, how have these initiatives impacted the lives of uh, the nation's youth? So like even in 2021, yes, the ministry was established by the Honorable Prime Minister in 2020. Minister Heinz was, of course, the first minister. And what I met in place was a national youth policy approved by cabinet up to 2025 with a clear pathway of how do we impact the lives of many young people as possible. We have roll out significant initiatives. Many of those initiatives we uh, have gotten positive feedback on in the various areas that we have vented into, skills for work, agriculture, tech voc in uh, training, industrial training, and all of them heavily oversubscribed with a very high uh, rate of success on each occasion. Coming out of that, the feedback we have gotten, uh, you know, we have been able to determine we have touched the lives of at least 15,000 young persons in a positive way. And uh, the other ministries that we partner with, Ministry of Education, Ministry of, of uh, Trade and Industry, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Public Utilities, they also have programs geared towards the development of young persons. And collectively, uh, we have been able to reach at least 30,000 young persons out of that 500,000 pool. Now, this does not include the students who are in regular secondary school or tertiary education. We're talking about a category of young people that we refer to as NEAT, uh, not in education, training, or employment. And in society, not much part of the productive sector. And therefore, collectively as a government, we have adopted this all of government approach with the Ministry of Youth development spearheading the initiative to interact and impact the lives of those young people in a positive way to bring them into the productive sector in terms of employment and business where they have that desire. I remember you talking about NEET in particular. There was an initiative, a program that you recently launched uh, in together in, in collaboration with the um, Cipriani College of Labor. Um, could you tell us more about this? That particular program, CARE, which we do in collaboration with Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, is geared towards attracting those young persons who may have come out of secondary school without a full certificate. And if we leave them as unattended, then they either go into some level of underemployment or unemployment, not able to realize their full potential. With this partnership, we will give them uh, tuition, in several subject areas for another year, and then arrange for them to resit the exam. Uh, we have gotten, we are, we are targeting a thousand persons per cohort and recently launched at Cipriani and the response of course was overwhelming. This will have a direct impact. I mean, we talk about different ministries um, coming together. This will have an impact basically on the youth in terms of youth in crime and so on. Yes, it definitely does. Um, you know, there's an old saying that idle hands are the devil's workshop. I think, I, I hope I got it right. But what it, what it suggests is that if you are not involved in anything productive and you're just sitting idle, then you become an uh, easy target to be recruited by the criminal elements. And so we have decided to invest significantly in our young people to get them into programs that will occupy their time in a positive way and train them and certify them for the workplace and for entrepreneurship. That way, 
we reduce the number of persons available in that need category uh, who are very vulnerable and especially those in high risk areas become easy target for the criminal element. So yes, we do see it as one of the mechanisms aimed at crime reduction in the, in, the, in the long and medium term. Minister, you've set a goal for yourself. I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's 1,500 farmers by 2025. How far along are you with that goal? Oh, our youth and agriculture, youth and women agriculture program is doing very well. We have the Youth Agricultural Homestead Program, which I spoke about on the last occasion. Since then, we have been able to distribute 159 two-acre parcels in Chatham to these young farmers. Only this week, we graduated another 168 uh, in the part-time program out of UGT. So with the Homestead Program, the Tucker Valley Shade House Program, which Prime Minister opened some time ago, the aquaculture program, which is also doing quite well. And then recently, cabinet approved a fresh vegetable community program where we will train CPEP workers in the whole, uh, in the technology uh, concerning shade house farming. Those four programs together uh, have been doing quite well. But the first three is where we are aiming to get our 1,500 farmers, 1,000 in terms of homestead, 300 in terms of the shade house farming and 200 in terms of the aquaculture. And we are about, I would say, in terms of training and certifying these new farmers, about 80% on the way to that. Minister, a total of $338 million have been allocated in fiscal 2025 uh, with an additional $150 million available uh, for the Youth in Agriculture Initiative. I believe that's through the Ministry of Finance. How much of this allocation goes into recurrent expenditure? And tell us about some of the projects that's being undertaken in 2025. Of that 300 plus million you mentioned, about 110 would be for development uh, initiatives. And that would capture the training programs we were speaking about and some of the infrastructure works that we currently engage in in respect of the rehabilitation of the youth camps and the youth centers. And the agricultural incentive, which we have access to for our youth and women agriculture programs, you mentioned is the agricultural incentive coming out of the Ministry of uh, Finance. Uh, that, of course, we will tap into to make sure we can fund our agricultural programs. And the remaining amount of that will be for recurrent expenditure. You also talked about, I mean, there's several initiatives you recently launched, one with TNTEC, one with WASA. I believe one is bulb, one is uh, pipe, and some of these other initiatives. Um, tell us about this and how much exposure do the youths have to get into this particular initiative? Two very successful programs. It's uh, in the apprenticeship programs, one with TNTEC, which is FUSE, and it has been very successful. Uh, it's currently uh, ongoing. Uh, we had a significant number of applications because I think people are interested in working in the utilities. And then the other pipe is with WASA, another very significant program training persons in plumbing and pipe laying. The fuse deals with overhead line maintenance and, and so forth. And those two programs directly train persons to get involved in possibly working with utilities, but also uh, working with subcontractors in those particular areas. So yes, we got a very high uh, application rate for those two programs and the students who are enrolled are doing quite well and looking forward to entering those uh, industries. Minister, I mean, we have so many initiatives from the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, yet, you know, there are still people who say that they're not hearing about it and so on. I mean, um, is there a, a somewhat of a disconnect or do we have to reach out to the people more, the youths in particular, to get them involved directly into this program? Well, in all, in addition to all that we have done, I'm prepared to go on Independence Square in a suit and advertise it if it's necessary. Anything that we do to make sure that the young people are aware of these programs. Uh, we advertise on traditional uh, media. We advertise on social media in a very heavy way because that's where the young people are. Uh, we have the youth caravan, the youth education and career caravan, which moves from community to community and set up shop at a particular location and then invite the young people to come to that venue where they can get the information and sign up. It's all of government uh, initiative because all of the ministries send their representatives to that location. So we have the youth in education, we have the youth in agriculture, we have the youth in business and uh, all the other agencies concerned with young people and their development all set up shop 
and therefore in the community they get that first hand information. So we have been doing quite a lot with that, even in terms of the caravan, a mobile caravan moving through the streets and advertising the programs. There's only so much we can do. Uh, people will also have to have that self-drive to seek out the information, as it were. But as a government, we are doing all that we can to make sure that the information is available, including me appearing on this program now and saying to Trinidad and Tobago, these are all the programs we are doing for the development of our young people. The hoist program, where the, the crane operations program, the drilling rig operation program, the heavy equipment operation program. Uh, we, we have the air condition and refrigeration, auto mechanics, you name it. There is something for any young person interested in their personal development and of course our agricultural programs. You know, Mr. We always hear about students who have um, they, they, they don't like the, the education aspect itself, but they want to be more involved in that technical vocational aspect. Um, are we seeing more of that? People just want that hands-on experience? Yes, we are seeing a significant amount of that interest being generated over the technical vocational training. And one of the reasons would be because some people are just not so academically inclined. The other will be that some people who are academically inclined also want to have a skill as a second job. And uh, so we have been seeing that significant interest. People know that there is a demand for skilled people, and therefore they are making sure that they cover on both sides of the equation. And because of that interest, we have had to expand the offerings that we have. We've had to expand the, the cohorts as well. And that, of course, that, that sort of feedback, that monitoring and uh, feedback that we get allows us to help uh, and plan and direct what are the programs that we're putting out? Because we're just, just putting out programs for program's sake. We want to make sure when we train people that they are equipped and ready for a job out in the workplace. But other than that, if they do not wish to uh, get into working for anyone, that they can get into self-employment and open a small business. To support that, we have launched a micro and entrepreneurship grant through NETCO of $20,000. So that if you get trained in whatever particular skill and you want to set up a business, you don't have the capital to do it. You apply to NETCO, uh, you get some training for two or three weeks, and then you get this grant and you're able to go into your own business, uh, operate, hire yourself, and as well your peers or your family. Mm -hmm. Just switching focus a bit, uh, in the past few weeks, we've seen that issue of bullying in schools popping up. How is your ministry uh, assisting to deal with this issue? That is a very serious concern uh, for all of us in this country. I mean, bullying is not something that we should be proud of. It's something that we need to, to, to stamp out as much as we can. And we collaborate with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of National Security, which is actually a tripartite team, uh, within these three ministries, set up from these three ministries to look at the issue. And some of the programs that we have ongoing, such as the CCC, the MyLAT, the MyPart, programs run by the Defense Force in collaboration with the Ministry of Youth, uh, some of those programs will be tweaked and utilized to address this problem of uh, deviant behavior in school and how do we treat those persons who are expelled or suspended from school for that type of conduct and behavior? And how do we uh, move towards behavior change and a citizen who is all-rounded and understands the discipline that is required to survive in society? And I'm glad that you brought up the MyLAT program. Is this something we can use as a tool to help tackle bullying in schools? The MyLAT program has been very successful in terms of behavior change but not only behavior change in terms of creating the right environment where a lot of our young men in particular who would have underperformed at secondary school are doing quite well coming out of that program. What we have done is we've done some re-engineering of the program, uh, a, a, a sort of tweaking of the program to create another program we call MyLAT Asset or MyPart Asset. And that program is a program that we will launch to, in, to, to be able to absorb some of the students who have been expelled from school because we don't want to leave anyone behind. So while they may have run into problems at the school, this asset program will be able, run along the same lines of the MyLAD, will be able to accommodate some of these young people to make sure they can continue in education. In the last academic year, I understand that 
the Minister of Education, Dr. Nian Gatsby-Dolly, she said that 17 students were expelled uh, during that academic year, up from three the previous year. Um, in terms of the MyLad program, when someone gets expelled, is it that they enter the MyLad program automatically or what happens? No, because this is a voluntary program, there's no uh, way that the government can force students into it. It will have to be at some level of collaboration discussion and those are the uh, fine-tuning points that we are working on at this point in time. How many of those students, the 17, that were expelled entered, actually entered the MyLab program? I don't have that information available readily, but the facility is there. Uh, we have received several um, recommendations coming from the Ministry of uh, Education and we assign officers to treat them on a case-by-case -case basis. Minister, what makes the MyLab program so successful? Because um, going to some of the graduation ceremonies and stuff like that from, from the MyLab, um, it seems that these children are more in tune with what it is they do in terms of the education aspect and the holistic de the holistic development. It is the, it is the environment. So that the Defence Force brings on board a level of discipline that puts the participants into a frame uh, where they can focus and prioritize their time and attention on what uh, they should be doing. So that they focus as well on, uh, as I said, a high level of discipline. They are in a residential setting, so they are removed from disturbances and distractions that they would usually have within their community. And they have uh, support staff that work very closely with them almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And that type of environment, of course, has certainly shown that it brings about a high level of result. The last time you were here, I believe you talked about a girls' MyLat program and also a MyLat program in Tobago. How far along are we with in that? In relation to the female MyLat, we are currently working on the facility uh, that will be able to do so. And as soon as that is ready, we'll be able to speak to the public on a time frame for the launch of it. And in relation to Tobago, I was in Tobago a couple of weeks ago, we are engaged in discussions with the Tobago House of Assembly and we aim to sign an MOU with the THA in the not too distant future. Um, up to as recent as this week, I was in conversation with them. Um, I plan to visit Tobago next week where those discussions will continue. And once we are able to put those administrative arrangements in place, we will be able to have uh, MyLat operating on this style as well. Minister, given all that's available to the nation's youth, um, why do we see a lot of young people, mostly men, um, charged with criminal activities or being involved in criminal activities? Because we have so many, as we talked before, we have so many opportunities in terms of um, all these, the, the Fuse project and, and, and so on. Um, why do you think we still see these children, these students going down this path? Well, we do have a lot more to be done. It is not that um, we think that uh, we have the perfect solution, but we continue to make sure the opportunities are available. You're always going to find, I don't know of a society that is crime free. We are not happy about the crime levels at this point in time. And that's why as a government, we invest so heavily in directing our young people along the right path. But the more of our young people that we can impact, we imagine that it will reduce, as I said earlier, the number of young persons who get involved in a life of crime. And as well, those uh, repeat offenders would be something that we also be looking at in conjunction with the Ministry of National Security to see how can we uh, tap into those persons who may have offended the law and serve time, but we want to make sure that if and when they return to society, that they will be able to lead productive lives. And that is another aspect of the intervention that we will be paying some level of attention to. At your ministry recently, I believe there was a distribution of checks to friendly societies. There's now a push to ensure that friendly societies receive these monies more um, timely. Uh, we talked to the, the registrar of the friendly societies, Mr. Michael Seals, and he said, you know, there is a push by the ministry. Um, how, how, how much are we going to see in terms of these friendly societies in, in the coming year? It is the, one of the areas that we have placed some level of attention to. We have a very proactive uh, commissioner, uh, registrar, sorry, of friendly societies in Mr. Michael Seals. And he and his team uh, have been doing a lot of work and that's why they've reached the point now where they can now uh, pay out to these members of 
societies that have been deregistered, monies that have been outstanding to them in some cases for decades. So that I applaud the work that they are doing and I encourage them to continue heading in that direction. And at the ministry level and the government level, we will give them the support that is required. I understand that some of these uh, friendly societies that has been, have been deregistered in the past, uh, some are 100 years old, 150 years old. Uh, Mr. Seals told us of one particular instance where uh, the Friendly Society was actually formed in 1889 or so. Um, you know, how much of that push are we going to see to the Friendly Societies? And, you know, they keep on calling for this to be, for their checks to be readily available. And because we see many people, just when we had that check distribution just about a month ago, just the days before, we saw one of the persons who were due to receive the check, he passed away the Wednesday before. Um, it is something that they, they look forward to. That particular model of friendly societies has been around for a long time. And uh, it is something that we think has been very useful in the past. And that is why you see that initiative now to focus on educating the younger population about the benefits of the friendly, friendly society movement. So that the advisory council appointed by cabinet on this matter is working closely along with the registrar and we expect that not only the promotion is going to be heightened, but as well the regulation and the uh, ins and ensuring that those persons who are awaiting their funds from societies that have been deregistered will receive those in a timely manner. But it also involves a level of promotion of the whole concept of the friendly society and the benefit of that model within the community. Minister, for the public who may not know about for friendly societies, to be honest, I wasn't aware of it until recently. Um, what exactly are friendly societies and how do they impact the population? The friendly society is a, is a community based type of organization. I would say if you use credit unions as an example, it, you can possibly use it, but it's not a credit union. It's a group of persons coming together with similar interests in a community and they contribute to this organization and they form the organization for similar interests. So you have friendly societies that deal with funeral benefits. You have friendly societies that uh, form different types of businesses and put, put, you know, perform a certain service to a community. And therefore, it really is a group of persons coming together with similar interests and govern under the Friendly Societies Act, which spells out how they are governed. Just winding down now, what are some of the challenges that you continuously face at the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service? Well, I, I, I focus more, my, my life really is a focus on positivity so that I don't spend much time, uh, you know, wasting on what uh, one might consider the challenges that, keep, that, that will keep me back or keep the work of the ministry back. We have a job to do. We have been given an assignment by the Honorable Prime Minister. We look at the resources that are provided. We use as the roadmap the uh, youth policy, the community recovery report, the vision 2030 document, and we take those very seriously and we look at how can we rule out an agenda that gives us the kind of result we want within a particular time frame. How do we engage the national youth population? How do we move them from point A to point B in a positive way? And then we can monitor and evaluate that. So how, how do we use that information to then expand the range of what we are doing so that eventually you have understood within the society an ecosystem of youth development that takes a young person from a point of dream to a point of planning and reality and steering them into the productive sector because the more of them we get involved in the productive sector, it will serve as a fuel for development. The Prime Minister always says that hard work is for young people. We believe that we are going to afford them the training. We are going to invest in them. We are investing in the future of Trinidad and Tobago through investment in our young people. Minister, you earlier said that uh, you've been in this ministry since 2021, I believe. Um, what are some of your major achievements since then? I would say in particular, our work in the agricultural sector and making sure that we uh, prepare young people and restock our aging uh, farm and population. I would say the tremendous level of training that we have uh, rolled out in terms of industrial and other technical vocational areas. And altogether, the mentorship and national service that we have rolled out to make sure that our population of adults 
do what they can, having succeeded, to mentor the younger ones who are coming up and indeed the future of Trinidad and Tobago. I think we are making a great impact and we're going to continue doing that. Your final thoughts? My final thoughts, I would say to every citizen, it is our responsibility to make sure that we invest in a brighter future for Trinidad and Tobago. It's not only the role of the government, the private sector, and various other institutions, religious bodies. We think it is an all of society approach, more than an all of government approach. And therefore, if we want to see a better Trinidad and Tobago, if we want to see true crime reduction, it means that we have to invest in our main resource, which is the people in this case, is the young people who would constitute the future we all like to see. We have been speaking with Minister of Youth Development and National Service, the Honorable Foster Cummings, and we've been talking about uh, agriculture, uh, youth and agriculture, that is, in terms of the Shade House Program, MILAT, um, the certain initiatives like, like PIPE and FUSE and so on. Minister, thanks very much for joining us. It has been a very uh, elaborate discussion in terms of many, so many of the, the initiatives that is available at the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. I welcome all and every opportunity to share the information with the national population. Thank you, Sunil. It was a pleasure being here. Join us at the same time next week for another episode of Delving Deeper. I am Sunil Lala. On behalf of the entire group, have a great night. <laughs>